I know you just sat down, um, but can I ask you to stand for the reading of God's word this morning? Comes out of Colossians chapter three, starting in verse one. Hear the word of the Lord. Since then you who have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As we continue this series in Colossians, just to, in case you were out on vacation and missed it, week one was all about this, that, that Christ is above all creation. That above everything, he is the supreme one. He has the supremacy over all things. He created it, and then when it was broken, he restored it. Both of those two things together give him the supremacy over all things. Last week, uh, Pastor Jeff Olive preached about the fact that Jesus is above all kingdoms and authorities. And I already mentioned that he, his, his big takeaway from last week, which could not be more true, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. I'll tell him that every, everybody said everything. And so Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so today we look at if Jesus is above all creation and Jesus is above all kingdoms and authority, and as we who are offered to be his sons and daughters of his kingdom, which is arguably the number one thing God talk, Jesus talked about in his three years of ministry is the kingdom of God. In the very beginning, when he steps into the synagogue and he's handed the scroll of Isaiah and he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to set the captives free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that the kingdom of God is near and is at hand. So what does it mean for us as the body of, of the church, his bride, his sons, his daughters, to carry the culture of the kingdom of God? These first four verses that we read in Colossians 3 really work as a baptismal covenant, a baptismal vow. As people would have been baptized in Colossae, as Paul writes this letter to them, this could be baptismal vows. As he begins with the reminder that since then, meaning there has been a past, but now there is a future and a present, you have been raised with Christ. The old is gone, the new is set. I love this, that in that day, a lot of times when they would baptize new believers, they would go into the water and they would have their clothes on and, and they, would, they would go into the water and they'd come back afresh and they would be handed a white cloth, a white shirt, a white outer garment to show to the world, to show to all those around me that I am new in Christ, I'm living in Christ. What was dead is now risen in Jesus. What was broken is now not just redeemed but restored and given new life. I have been resurrected in purity, not of my own self, but in who Jesus is. And then Paul goes on to talk about what we have to talk about today, which is this, that your life should look like Christ. Not only are we called to be saved by Christ, but to live as Christ. Now let me be really clear, what I'm not saying this morning is that you get to become God. Like there are religions around the world that say, hey, if you do all the right things, if you muster up the faith, if you, if you fall in line the right way, if you say the right words and don't do the right thing, or do the right things, that you become a God in and of yourself. And we are not saying that. We believe in one God. A Trinitarian God, three in one and one in three, Father, Son, and Spirit, from eternity for eternity. But what we are saying, and what I wanna push us a little bit this morning on, as Pastor Mark often says, may, may you comfort the, the afflicted, and if so necessary, afflict the comforted. What I wanna push on the gas a little bit this morning is that our life, according to Jesus and in Paul's writings and all of Scripture, should move in the direction that it looks like Jesus. That you should look more like Jesus tomorrow than you did today. And in three years, and in 10 years. Not out of a position of shame or religious duty, but out of a holy relationship with who Jesus is. 
That has to be our corner place. And so that is what Paul sets up for us. He's gonna set up three things for us this morning into which to live into the life he's called us to. And the first one is this. It's a holy posture. It's a holy posture for us as the church. This is what the holy posture kind of breaks down into these three things. Rooted identity. Uh, two weeks ago when I started this series, we talked about the centrality of Jesus in our life. That I had the audacious statement to take Jesus out of first place in your life and make him central in your life. Because when he's in first place in your life, he stays in first place, but rarely as, the, as we live our life does he go into the, all the other realms. But if we put Jesus center in our life, then when it, wherever we go and have our being, wherever we move and, 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 and re, have relationships with people, the things that we come in contact with, if he is central, he goes with us. And so Paul, as he's about to push the gas on, on, on this thing called sanctification, on this thing about looking like Jesus, he roots it in the fact that you have been raised with Christ. That is your center place in the rooted identity as a beloved son or daughter who has said yes to Jesus. And then he says this, set your hearts on things that are above. What does that mean, set your heart? Set your heart on the things that are above, meaning him who is seated at the right hand. You have a responsibility as a beloved son, as a beloved daughter, to set your heart on the things of God, meaning your time, your finances, your attention. And the reason I put finances in there is not because I'm looking for another offering in the church, but because scripture tells us where our treasure is, there so our heart is. So, so I'm not saying like just talking about offerings. Where do we give our money to? How do we give to holy things? How do we pay for holy things? How do we not pay and hold back from unholy things? You set your heart on things that are above. Then Paul says, set also your mind. Set your mind. What are the things that are spoken over you? What are the things that you feed your mind day in and day out? What are the things that you, you watch and listen that feed the thing that is your mind. Paul says, as a rooted in your identity, as a saved child of the king, you set your heart and you set your mind on things that are above. And here's how he finishes this, just beautiful. Verse four, he says, when Christ, who is your life, that you are hidden in, in verse three, appears, meaning when he comes back one day, then you also will appear with him in glory for eternity. And so we... First thing we do to step into, as Paul, like I said, pushes the gas a little bit on the acceleration of us becoming more like who Christ is. He first roots us in the identity as beloved sons and daughters. Because so often what the church has done, what religion does, it says, hey, I need you to do the thing. It's about what you do. And Paul's saying, it's not about what you do first. It's about who you are first and whose you are first. That is the core. And from that position, now we step into doing there's this beautiful moment of Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus appears in all of his glory. And next to him is Moses and Elijah representing the, the Torah and representing the prophets. The law and the prophets, they're all there. And Peter, just like how Peter does, he speaks up. He's like, hey, this is awesome. Let's build some stuff. Let's do some stuff. Let's stay here forever. And God the Father speaks and he's like, hey, hush. And two, he says, Jesus looks at him and goes, we have to go down the mountain. Because there's work to be done. And there's work to do in our life and work to do in the lives of those around us. And I don't think we talk about it enough, but your life can and is called to look just like Jesus. Paul has an audacious statement in one of his letters where he said, until you're ready to follow Jesus, he's talking to the church, follow me. He's not saying he has everything figured out and perfect, but he knows this, that if you will follow him, you will find Jesus. Can we say that of ourselves today? So he goes on. So the holy posture is rooted identity, setting your heart and setting your mind. The next two things I need you to know are done at the same time. Rooted, a, rooted, a holy posture is first and foremost, and the next two are done at the same time, but very different. And the first is this. We have a holy posture, and then we, have to need, and we need to have a holy warfare. Here's what Paul writes. Put to death, therefore, whatever longs, or whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. Now, again, he's pointing to the old. You used to do these things. But 
and the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such of these things, anger and rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self with its practices. I love what John Wesley, um, in, he has this thing called the, John Wesley has this thing called the his explanatory notes, which means basically John Wesley read the whole Bible, obviously multiple times, but it, then he went back in every verse, almost every verse in scripture, John Wesley wrote at least a sentence about. It's incredible. And so when I study, I, I, I go, what did John Wesley say about these verses or whatever? And this is how he translated and, and spoke upon this line that says, put to death, therefore whatever longs, belongs to your earthly nature. This is what he says. He says, slay with a continual swing. I love this. It's not a one-time thing. Can we be honest this morning that the things of our old self, the things that we struggled with, the things that separated us from God in the beginning, that when we said yes to Jesus just didn't automatically go away? The desire doesn't go away. The temptation doesn't go away. I would even say more so once you said yes to Jesus, the enemy kind of tries to tempt you even more, push you into things even more, to, to, to pull you not out of a, a, a salvation, but pull you out of the intimacy with God. And what John, John Wesley's saying and what Paul is saying is not only do you put to death this thing, but you slay it continually. You continually, intentionally have a, have a guard up with what Ephesians 5 and 6 would say would be the, the sword of the spirit. You, you, you are armed up and ready to put to death the very thing that God calls you to put to death so that the intimacy, the beauty, the taste of who Jesus is does not lack anything. This is where in Philippians 2.12, tells us to work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling. This is in Romans where, where the writer says, well, because of grace, shall we go on sinning all the more? Of course not. This is where Jesus looks at the man at the pool of Bethesda and heals him and says, go and sin no more. This is when the woman who is called in adultery is brought before Jesus and Jesus has all the right. The religious leaders bring her out and say, look what she's done. Look who she is. Well, this is what the law says. And Jesus writes in the sand. He looks at them and he says, you without a sin, throw the first stone. Go for it. And with the oldest, they begin to drop stones. So there's forgiveness. There's freedom offered in that moment. And I just imagine it, right? Jesus gets down in the dirt with this woman and he looks at her. And what must have been shame in her eyes and despair, he says, daughter, if they don't condemn you, neither do I. You are forgiven. But how does he end it? Go and sin no more. Not that Jesus is expecting her to live a completely perfect life from that moment there, but the sin that so easily entangled her, the sin that she was brought before, he says, go and sin no more. He wouldn't give us a call to go and sin no more with the things that so easily entangle us if that wasn't a possibility. But like Pastor Jeff said last week, we talk about Jesus as our Savior, but we got to talk about Jesus as our Lord and Jesus as our King just as much as he is our Savior, to fall under the culture of the kingdom of God, to step into the holy righteousness that he has for us. So Paul is pushing, pushing on the, the, the gas here, moving us forward. So there's holy warfare. And at the same time, there's holy living. Hear these words from, as, as Paul continues to write in verse 10. It, after he just said, take off the old self with his practices, he says this, and half put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Now, mind you, verse 10 just says, put on the new self. What's the new self? It's being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Sounds a lot like verse two where we started, where it said, set your mind on things that are above. If you set your mind on things that are above, you yourself will be renewed in the knowledge of who Christ is. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Here it is, my friend, therefore, as God's chosen, holy people and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against one, someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these things, over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them 
all together in perfect unity. If the old self was sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, then the new self that we clothe ourselves in are these, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, forgiveness. That is the new self. Christ is calling us to these things, to put on these things. I don't know about you, but um, sometimes old habits have to be broken down for new habits to begin. Like I am, um, I've, I've just kind of started a new rhythm. I love golf. I can talk to you about golf all day long and uh, I probably don't need to, but I absolutely love it. And so I played in high school and I was a hothead. I would just all over the place, but the lo- older I've gotten, the better I've gotten because I don't care as much, but I do care. And so I started taking up lessons. And, uh, and so um, every other Thursday or whatever, I'll go take a lesson with a friend of mine and, and he is completely redoing my swing because it's needed. And can I tell you, it's not easy. It's not easy to remember what needs to be forgotten. I've got 20 plus years of a bad swing in me that's having to be taken away point by point, balance by balance, hand position by hand position. But can I tell you that when I step in and I swing what he is teaching me to swing, there is a crack on that iron that I've never heard before. That's what Jesus does, my friends. He brings you in. He doesn't clean you up and then bring you in. He brings you in. But after he's brought you in, he begins to refine you and restore you. The things even, like some of the obvious things go away pretty quickly. I don't need to be doing this. I don't need to be doing this. The anger, the malice. But then there are things as you journey with Jesus, for those of us who have been journeying with Jesus for a while, that he begins to really get deep down past the action and down to the motive and down to the heart and begins to purify those things in our life. The kingdom of God has a culture, and it's this. I love that he ends this moment with uh, this scripture where he says, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these, things, all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. He's going back to the very beginning. So therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, Set your heart on things that are above. Set your mind on things that are above. That when Christ, who is your life, appears in glory, you will also appear with him. That love, that agape love, that is not based on what you have done or what you will do, but based on his love for you. When we receive that, when we walk in that, then we are able to forgive and be patient and to be kind. We are able to step into authority that Christ has given you He has given you authority, my friends, to step in and to slay with a continual swing the things that so easily entangle our life. We are both saved by Christ and called to live as Christ. We are both saved by Christ and called to live by Christ. J.D. Walt calls this the second half of the gospel. This is the sanctification. How does Jesus do it really quickly? Jesus says, I do nothing apart from what the Father does. What I see the Father doing, that is what I do. What I hear the Father saying, that is what I say. So we had a relational reliance, tug, line between him and the Father. And in John chapter 20, he goes to breathe on his disciples after his resurrection. He says, receive the Holy Spirit, my friends. And he breathes on them. He says, stay and wait until the Holy Spirit falls on you again at the beginning of the church in Acts 2. And they do that. And now it is our call to have a relational reliance on what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. As we are central on who Jesus is and loved by the Father, we follow in step and in line with doing whatever it is we see the Spirit doing, whatever we see the Holy Spirit saying, and it can all be confirmed in these words. If it's outside of these words, it's just Mexican last night or Italian or bad pizza or just your own motives. But if what you sense the Holy Spirit is confirmed in this, then we move and we step and we have our being. But look how he ends this, verse 15. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. This is going back to the mind. And admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, the Father, God the Father, through him. 
What he ends this moment with is he's saying, you root yourself in a holy posture with Jesus. You go to holy warfare against everything that is separating you from Jesus, the intimacy with Jesus, and you step into holy living. But, but he, he ends this moment with you do that in a holy community. You do that with among each, and of, each, of, uh, each, and each one of each else. I mean, can I be honest, as a person on staff who oversees some different ministries, we are not creating ministries just so the buffet of ministries here at the Woodlands Methodist Church gets bigger. The last thing we need is a buffet of ministry offerings just to have a buffet of ministry offerings. But I can tell you this, my friends, we are creating places and spaces for you to meet with Jesus in community. I mean, that's the first step in our discipleship pathway called grow is to gather in community. That's Bible studies. That's learning about who Jesus is. That's connect classes or Sunday school classes. That's pastoral seminars and teachings and pastor led studies. I mean, that is incredible. But there's also the living aspect. We want to learn about Jesus, but we want to live like Jesus. So there's home groups. I know we talked about home groups in the announcements. This is what home groups is. Bible studies and connect classes, I get asked this question a lot. It's about learning about who Jesus is. Home groups as we continue to, to work on it and to, to mold it to what God's called us to create it to be is about living like Jesus, being formed in the image of Jesus. This is the place that, my friends, you're gonna be asked, how is it with your soul? What are the sins that so easily entangle you? What are the successes you've seen Jesus do in your life? What are the burdens that you're carrying? Can we just agree that burdens are not always sinful? I got some burdens that aren't sin, but I'm carrying them heavily. What are the burdens that you're carrying? Well, you're offering gathering in community. Women, can I just speak to you for a moment? I have never seen a church so rich in their women's ministry than the Woodlands Methodist Church. You have offering upon offering, night and day and morning, Pastor Luann has, has, is, is, is leading this incredible ministry with her team. For you to find community, to go deep in the things of God so you can step in and not just be saved by Christ, but to live like Christ. Men, I know we're talking about it a lot with this men's conference. We're not talking about it because we want to take a picture with all the men in the room. It's not about numbers. I could care less about numbers, but what I do care about, men, is that you know that there are deeper questions in this life than how is your 401k and how is your golf game and how is the latest trip you took? But there are questions that go, how is it with your soul? Are you tired and weary? I think there's a beauty of gathering men together where, where there is a way, not above women. Women, hear me. We are egalitarian here. We believe that one and the same. But men, I believe that God has called us to be a man in a certain way for this day and this time and it's found in the scriptures. So this conference, it's not long. It's Friday night through Saturday at like right after lunch. And we're bringing speakers from around the country to tell you and to walk with you that have deeply walked with Jesus to say this is the way God has called men for this day and always. This is how God has called you to be a man in your house with your, with your wife and with your children. This is the way God has called you to be men among men. You need a small group of guys around you. And finally, this is the way God's called men to be men among generations. Older men, please hear me. We need you. We need you to speak wisdom and love and light and strong words to us. And younger men, we need you. Acts, when, when the Holy Spirit falls in Acts, he said old men and women will dream dreams and young men and women will have visions. It's when those two come together that the wisdom of the older generation can step in and pour out to continue the mantle of what the older generation has sacrificed in a way that we will never know or see. But we stand in its beauty. And for the message to go forward, men, we need each other. And then Quest kicks off two weeks later as we continue. We are not just here to talk about opportunities just to have opportunities. Karen's not just going on mission trips to go on mission trips. But we do it so we step into the life God has called us to live so that we can look like Jesus and live like Jesus, not just in thought and theology, but in practice and in life. 
So I'll end with this. Um, we, uh, a lot of you know, we've been here a year and a half and it's just been incredible and, and hope to be here for decades more. But um, we came from Nashville and uh, a lot of you know it because you, you go vacation there and you, you like would drive us nuts. And, um, and so uh, Nashville is an incredible city. And in that part of Nashville, one of the things Claire and I really loved to do, my wife, especially before our, our four-year-old was born, was we loved, we're, we became like low-level, very low-level uh, cheap but low-level foodies in Nashville. And uh, it's an incredible city to uh, eat food. And so uh, we would go out on Sunday nights um, and eat um, and on date nights. And we went on Sunday nights because y'all had all left and gone home. And, uh, and so we, we would go. And so we begin to watch all these like, you know, chef's table and top chef and all those things. I just love food. And, uh, and so one that I came across, uh, this documentary on food is one of my favorites of all time. And it used to be on Netflix and it's now on YouTube, but I'm going to butcher the name of it because the whole thing's in Japanese. Um, but it's called gyro or, or, or something like that. Ono's, uh, dreams of sushi. I don't know if you've seen it. And it's this 85 year old man who has won three Michelin stars as a sushi chef. And it's his, his office or his, his restaurant is like seven, maybe eight seats. It's, in, it's, it's as you go down into the subway in Tokyo. And, um, and what's crazy is this. I, I didn't even realize this until I watched it the other day again. But he said this, the first two times he won, um, he, he's won the three Michelin stars three times. The first two times he won it, it was his apprentice that made the sushi, not even him the level in which he does it. And they talk about the simplicity of his rice and his fish and his wasabi and the, his soy sauce, the way he puts it together, the way he chooses it at the market. And his rice guy's the expert and his fish guy's the expert and his shrimp guy's the expert, his wasabi guy's the expert. And he talks about all this, putting it together, simple food with profound flavor. And this is what he said in the documentaries. Just, I love it. He says, in order to make delicious food, you must eat delicious food. You need to develop a palate capable of discerning good and bad. Without a good taste, you can't make good food. If your sense of taste is lower than that of the customers, how will you ever impress them? He goes on to say, he goes, I can't just basically, I'm putting in American words, he goes, I just can't go to McDonald's and have a burger. It'll ruin my palate. For the, I need to be able to taste the intricacies and the flavor and the beauty of these fish and of this rice as I put it together for my customer. My friends, it is the same with Jesus. We need a palate that knows the beauty and love of Jesus. We need a palate that knows what it is to take of bread and wine and receive the forgiveness of life. We need to rid ourselves of, of things in our life that is ruining our palate for the things of God. And so we continually slay, as Paul says, as, as sorry, as John Wesley says, as we put to death these things. But please hear me, because if you go out of here today and you think Pierce just said do this and do this and do this, and you miss that all of the things I'm calling you to do and to step into, one, is possible in your life, but it's not rooted first and foremost as a beloved son and daughter in the finished work of Christ. You'll fumble and you'll fall in all of this. You'll never finish it. You'll never get to where Christ has called you. You'll never take a step into the holy life he's called you. And I don't know what the thing is that you are being overcome with and you struggle with with, but can I tell you there is freedom in Jesus name there is overcoming in Jesus name you don't have to hold on to the addiction you don't have to hold on to the affair you don't have to hold on to the bad, bad handling of things you don't have to hang on to the anger or the malice or the intent to hurt others whatever it is that you're holding on to there is freedom and the enemy will tell you you will always hold on to these things my friends but that's not true Jesus has offered you life and life to the full and he's offered you a holy life in his name and so what happens when we are saved by Christ? Live and love like Christ? Well, the world will truly see the beauty of Christ. They'll see it. They'll see it in your life. They'll see it in my life. Rooted in him, but from that rooted, stepping out into all that he has for you in community with a holy people. My friends, there is no shame in this room. There is no judgment. There's forgiveness and freedom 
for all that you have te- step, stepped through and stepped in. So let me pray for us as we end this morning. So God, we love you. We thank you so much for your forgiveness, for your grace. God, will you give us a hunger for the holiness of God? May we taste and see your holiness. May we taste and see your beauty. You are above all creation. You are above all kingdoms and authorities. And you are above every way of life. And so from that agape love that you have just relentlessly poured out on us, give us the strength and ability in community to put to death the things that hold us back from you and to clothe ourselves in the culture of the kingdom of God, which is patience and love and forgiveness. And let that love that you so graciously poured out bind all of those things together. May we taste and see that you are good. And from tasting and seeing your beauty and your goodness and your love, be able to offer that to the world around us. As we encounter a dying and broken and starving world for the goodness of God. In your name we pray, amen.